So we're going to look at elastic deformation. Elastic deformation. See if we can start to really define it and, and understand what uh, what it means. I think that uh, a nice way to start off is to think about something that you're perhaps familiar with, and that would be an elastic band. Um, you know, why is that called an elastic band? You know, you, these are or some of you might call it a rubber band. Uh, you know, one of these elastics you might put in your hair if you've got long hair and you want to tie it back in a ponytail. Um, you stretch it out and 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 um, it gets longer and you let it go and it goes back to the same shape. In fact, that's a nice little, just that little statement there is kind of a nice description of elastic deformation. That you could say uh, the sample returns to um, original dimensions upon unloading. So that's kind of a macroscopic description of elastic deformation, uh, but it's useful. And if we were to take that definition down to the atomic level, you could reason that, um, you know, perhaps atoms, in fact, return to um, their original resting positions upon unloading as well. And, and that's a nice definition uh, because it's going to take us to an interesting little discussion. And it's also going to allow us later to discuss what plastic deformation is. So let's look at that atoms return to the original rest positions upon unloading. And to do that, let's let's just sketch here a simple little sketch where the we've got these atoms um, here, atoms, okay, atoms are modeled as spheres. Of course, they're circles today because I can't draw a sphere really very quickly. Um, and what's that thing in the middle there? That's meant to be a spring. Okay, So we've got two spheres connected to one another by a spring. And so what we can do with that is we could say, well, what would happen if I applied a force to these things? Of course, the spring would stretch, and then you let it go, and then return back. But if you weren't touching it, they'd be at rest. Um, and they'd be at rest, separated from one another. We could define the center to center distance here. Um, uh, the spacing here between them, and that would be the the distance at rest that they they would be spaced from one another, and, and so we could in fact we could record the the force and the spacing, and if we did that, we could then plot that. This time I'm going to call it the interatomic force. That's that that force from that spring. It's a net force. I mean, on the atoms, there's an attractive force and a repulsive force. So it's the sum of those two. We're going to just call it the interatomic force, or I'll be a little more careful. I'll call it the net interatomic force. And then the interatomic spacing. And um, unfortunately, um, history is what it is. And, and we, we use the letter R for spacing, interatomic spacing. That's the convention that's used. So uh, I'll stick with the same convention that you'll encounter elsewhere. Uh, the reason that I say unfortunately is because, um, of course, R is often used for radius. So don't be confused and think that R, the interatomic spacing, refers to a radius. In fact, in this case, it's really two radii, if you will. But um, we're going to use R for the interatomic spacing. And then if we plotted what that interatomic force versus uh, interatomic separation could have looked like, the net one, it looks something like this. And that's actually quite neat because what we're doing is we're plotting force versus um, spacing, force versus distance, which is what we did in high school, right, when we plotted the spring constant. So we're getting an elastic response for some applied force. Oops. For some applied force, we're observing uh, a corresponding space, interatomic spacing. <clears throat> and so what we can we can then reason out is, well, how what the, the, the elastic response of the material is, the, the Young's modulus, should be uh, somehow a function of the elastic response of two atoms. And in fact, it turns out that um, it's actually quite simple, um, the relationship. If we, if we say, well, the, the interatomic force separation curve is roughly a straight line there, we could say, well, that, the slope of that straight line is just the, the derivative of that curve. That's the, the slope of, the, of that curve, df 
by dr at this particular value of r, and that's the special one called r naught. That's the equilibrium interatomic spacing. Let me write that in for you. Equilibrium interatomic spacing gets the designation R naught, where force net force is zero. So the slope of that curve tells us the relationship between force and displacement at the equilibrium spacing or the rest spacing. So we can make this nice little concluding statement here that the Young's modulus, Young's modulus E, right, and just to make sure that we're talking we're all talking about the same thing here, this is E from the fame of Hooke's law, sigma equals E times epsilon. That's the Young's modulus that we're talking about. Um, Young's modulus is proportional to, it's direct, it's proportional to um, the slope of the interatomic force separation curve at r equals r naught. And that's a nice conclusion because it tells us that it's a function only a function only of the types of atoms, atom type, right? So as long as you don't change the type of atoms in the material, you won't change the Young's modulus. And so there's a, there's a, a statement that's actually quite common. It's common enough that I think I should write it down for you, describing Young's modulus. And that is that Young's modulus, Young's modulus, modulus, if I could spell, um, is structure independent. And let me explain that for you. Structure independent. It's so important that I'm going to give it a red box just for kicks. There you go. It's structure independent. What does that mean? Structure independent structure, we're referring to microstructure. So there's all sorts of things that we can do to materials, um, you know, say to a metal, for example, to change its strength. You can change the aspects of the arrangement of atoms, the microstructure, but it will not change the Young's modulus. And we'll see that uh, many times.